Planning Board meeting for Tuesday, December 21st, 2010. My name is Peter Hatem. First uh, item on our agenda will be the approval of the minutes from the previous meeting. Uh, does anybody have any questions, comments, changes? Elaine? I just had one very minor change. Um, on page four, under item, the item that's numbered two in that paragraph there, the second to the last line that begins with kill the road, two, T-O, should be added after kill the road. Okay. That makes sense. Any other questions, comments, thoughts, suggestions, omissions, changes? Hearing none, do I have a motion? So moved. Motion to approve, been made, seconded. All in favor of the motion? All opposed to the motion, motion carries seven, nothing. Uh, Carol, I'm sorry. Next item on the agenda, in by the sea, 600 cottages site plan amendment. The applicant could step up to the microphone, make the presentation, we'll consider it. Thank you. Uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Steve Bradstreet uh, with Oak Engineers, the engineering representative uh, for this project. With me tonight is uh, Kevin Mahaney uh, of the Olympia Companies and uh, Mark Burns of Foresight Architects. Um, when we were here before you uh, a month ago, um, there were a couple outstanding issues. We felt that uh, we wanted to be able to address them uh, efficiently uh, so we uh, can uh, effectively uh, addressing even at today's planning board meeting. So we asked for a workshop meeting two weeks ago, which we held, and uh, brought to your attention some of the things that we were doing. And the, the primary things that we were looking at were the decibel uh, levels of the AC units on the side of the building. We were also looking at um, a, a couple comments from that was actually a comment from an abutter, but also sight lines from an abutter uh, as uh, opposed to what occurs today with the existing building. And also the uh, septic field, the actual uh, grease traps were bypassed and reconnection of that. And I think, I believe that you have in your package today, uh, there is a letter from Alfric. Um, this was actually conducted at the end of last week that all the uh, piping has been corrected. He has inspected it. Uh, it now does go through the grease trap uh, appropriately. So that uh, issue is now, um, I'm hoping, uh, put to rest. What I have provided in the, in a letter to uh, Maureen last Friday, I believe, um, actually two days ago, in regards to the decibel levels. Um, what we got from the manufacturer's rep is that the decibel levels with an unscreened AC unit one foot from the face of the unit uh, is 62 decibels. With the distance from here to the nearest property abutters line is 62 feet. And with information that you can readily get off the internet now, um, uh, there's a formula, there's actually a calculator. And that was in the package that I sent to Maureen, that if you put in the distance from your source, the uh, level at your source, it calculates what the decibel level would be unscreened at that distance. And that new level is 26.15 at the property line, closest to butter. Um, so there is no, and, and that meets the town's requirements for the uh, decibel uh, rating. We are providing a fenced-in area, primarily for screening it so no one can see it, and it is landscaped on either side with the exception of where we have to have the gates to be able to access it for maintenance. So we have provided uh, those changes. In the workshop, if you recall, um, the only thing that changed on my plans was I 
Excuse at the AC units, uh, turned 90 degrees from where, where they were. Um, I've readjusted them and adjusted the landscaping uh, appropriately. So those are the only changes from uh, what you've uh, seen previously. So the, um, that has been addressed also. So in other words, the decibel level. And that is actually, I think I gave you a chat that conversational speech is at one meter from a person is 60 decibel. We're now 26 over at this point, so we're well, you can sort of judge what uh, that sound level would be uh, based on that. The item that was brought up by um, and in butter was in relation to the um, site uh, view from his property or their property. See on the existing plan, there is an existing deck that extends out to this point. Our porch, well actually this is not a deck, this is a porch. Our porch extends is farther back. Based on the line, sight line, they actually, to break even, they might gain a little bit more available uh, distance to see. Plus the second floor is stepped back. The deck on the second floor is stepped back so that the actual sight line to the beach uh, is the same or has increased. And that was uh, something that an abutter had brought up as a concern in the last meeting, so we thought we'd uh, uh, address it also. I believe uh, those were the only items that were brought up in the planning board meeting at the time and in the workshop meeting that we needed to formally address. And without going through the design again, um, I think uh, I'd like to just leave it right there and just address any uh, comments that uh, the board may have. Thank you. So that concludes the uh, applicant's presentation? Yes, yes, it does. Okay. Open the public hearing. I'd like to, at this point, open the public hearing. I invite anyone wishing to speak concerning the uh, application uh, of in by the sea for the 600 cottage reconstruction site plan to step up to the microphone. Seeing none, I'll close the public hearing and I'll open it up to comments from questions, whatever, from the planning board. Victoria? I do have a question. Yes. And Stephen, you, you, you received the emails that I sent to Bruce Smith? That is correct, yes. Okay. I want to bring the board up to speed then on the emails that I've been, I sent to Bruce. On uh, last Friday, I was going through the package of information because I know how important the numbers are. Mm -hmm. uh, the numbers we've been looking at are the numbers um, at the end, but I started looking at the numbers that we're starting with. And what I did was I took the um, letter that we received in our package from December. Yes. And I compared it to the letter we had in our package in November. And I was looking at existing numbers. Mm -hmm. And as you read in my email, when I put the two existing numbers side by side, they all changed. Correct. And they all changed with the impervious numbers also changed. Correct. So I sent an email to Bruce. Yes. And I said to Bruce, I noticed that all the numbers changed. And I said, at the very end of this email. However, I'm not familiar with architectural calculations, and I would appreciate your insight and explanation. So I sent that off to Bruce last Friday, and um, I know he then contacted you, was it today? Today. This afternoon? Um, today. Contacted you today. And I know that you responded back to me, um, if I could paraphrase, but I certainly would, I do want to hear from you, paraphrasing yes. to the fact okay. that you met with Bruce. Yes. And yes, the numbers changed based upon your conversation with Bruce and that you stand by the new numbers. That's correct. And so I sent a follow-up. I received that information late this afternoon and okay. I sent a follow-up to Bruce saying I would still appreciate Bruce's insight and explanation as I'm still not clear okay. on why the existing building mm -hmm. and impervious numbers, they all increased. 
and my concern was then we times it by a certain number and we get our yes. final number. So you can see where my concern would be. Why did the first floor, the second, why did everything grow from November to December? So okay. Bruce didn't quite give me that insight and explanation, so okay. I certainly appreciate. Um, when we got the email from, actually a phone call first, and then uh, I talked with uh, Bruce, and he emailed or forwarded your emails to me, and I dis had a discussion with Mark. We went over our numbers, and um, and stood by him based on our latest discussions with Bruce, which is which generated the December letter to you. Um, what the difference is between let's call it November and December, is our interpretation of the ordinance. If you recall, we had a larger building, bigger footprint, bigger volume, and interpreted the square foot uh, floor area, the volume, and the impervious, well, I won't say the impervious, but those two at least that uh, were interpreted incorrectly by us. Bruce set us straight, and what it did was areas that were decking, um, were considered floor area and not and also impervious areas that were porches with a roof we considered volume they're not they're only square footage so our calculations in november were based on totally different criteria of what is square footage what is volume and what is impervious area when we re or again met with Bruce after that. He set us straight on um, what we actually should be calculating. When we did that, yes, we were over. And for that reason, you saw the building change. You saw it move back. The porch was added not because of aesthetics necessarily, but because we could use that as some of our area, our floor area but we had to step back some of the other units and use deck instead of walls, because walls denote volume, we couldn't do that. So it was all a discussion with Bruce in our interpretation, and yes, what we felt was existing floor area or existing volume was totally interpreted wrong according to the town's ordinances so back in November, you do have totally different numbers than you do in December, totally different. And it's based on uh, when you were out on the site walk, there were some of those outside staircases, the circular ones, the decks, and the porches that we were interpreting one way, the town's ordinances said no, uh, that isn't how it should be interpreted. So that either came out of the square foot area, or it came out of the volume, or it came out of both. So without going through each individual staircase, deck, or porch, um, I can't tell you exactly where it swapped, but it does swap. And when we sat down, after we did the second round of calculations, and we sat down with Bruce, uh, we went through each of the floor plans with the square foot area and the volume area based on floor to floor height showed him all the calculations, he matched it to his understanding of the ordinance and said it was acceptable. So today we went back through and just calculated our numbers because numbers are numbers, we could be wrong, but we, based on our calculations and our understanding and discussions with Bruce a few weeks ago, um, we feel that we have accurately represented uh, what the ordinances are. And in your cover letter dated December 3rd to Maureen, you asked, um, you said you met with Bruce and we have requested an approval letter from Bruce and it will be forthcoming. Have you received that approval letter from Bruce? That was a yeah. email from Bruce and we did receive that. I don't know if I have a copy of it in front of me, but we have, we Maureen have. has it, so we do have it. Thank you. Steve, so you sent an email to Victoria this afternoon? No, I did not. Okay, good. <laughs> I'm sorry if I said that. It was all through 
approves then. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Oh, no, I'm sorry. I didn't, no, I I didn't understand what's the... Just checking. <laughs> I sent mine to Bruce. Victoria, you all set. Any other questions? Well, uh, Goodbye, just, just to follow up. Did you receive a, an email from Bruce? I wouldn't have seen anything that came after 2.30 this afternoon. Okay. I saw an email about a week back where he said it can come up. I, I remember seeing that too. Yes, yeah. yeah. I, I strongly urged the applicant to confirm their new calculations with Bruce. Uh, and they did meet with him, and Bruce did confirm that he was satisfied that the new square footage existing and proposed calculations were consistent with the zoning ordinance. And then there was another, um, there were some questions raised by uh, Planning Board Member Valent, and uh, she sent those to Bruce as the code officer, and we were still waiting for his response on those. I'm comfortable with the calculations based on our conversations in the workshop. Thank you. And, and actually, for the record, I believe that your building volume calculations went down. So while um, area went up, okay. volume went yep. down. So they, I, I don't believe that they all went up just based okay. on my cross-referencing right now. Just make one comment about the back and forth and correspondence here. It's my understanding that all of that correspondence from a planning board member to Bruce and Bruce's response is all part of the public record and that all of us need to be copied on all of that correspondence. So if it, it apparently did not happen before our meeting, but I would request a copy of all of that correspondence. Sure. And we'll pursue that. Great, thanks. Any other discussion on the uh, application? Motions? Yes. Do you need a motion? Yes. Oh. oh. Motion for the board to consider. Yeah. Findings of fact. The Inn by the Sea LLC is requesting site plan review to demolish and rebuild the 600 cottage located at 40 Bowery Beach Road, which requires review under Section 99 site plan regulations. The town engineer is re recommending revisions to the plans. The application substantially complies with Section 99 site plan regulations. Therefore, be it ordered that, based on the plans and material submitted, and the facts presented, the application of In by the Sea LLC, located at 40 Bowery Beach Road, to demolish and rebuild the 600 cottage be approved, subject to the following conditions. One, that the plans be revised for the town engineer's comment stated December 15, 2010, and submitted to the town planner for review. And two, that there be no issuance of a building permit nor alteration of the site until the above condition has been met. Second. We'll give it to Barbara. Oh. All right. <laughs> Motion having been made by uh, Liza Quinn, seconded by Barbara Schenkel. Uh, any discussion on the motion? Hearing none, all those in favor of the motion? All those opposed to the motion? Motion carries 7 nothing. Thank you. Thank I you. just wanted to thank you for being really responsive to our concerns. Oh, thank you. Uh, I think you guys did a great job, and I'm, yeah. I'm sure the end will consider continue to be an asset. Thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Well, I'm going to the utility building. Yes. 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 Our, our English teacher is switching the ground. The next item on the agenda is the North Shore, North Shore Road Path Site Plan Amendment.
Members of the board, my name is Todd Gammon. I'm a civil engineer with AMEC, and I'm here tonight to talk about a minor revision to the Shore Road Path project. We got the path permitted in July of this year. As you remember, I sent you a package that includes two small revisions to that permitted site plan. Uh, the first revision, they both include boardwalk areas that were originally permitted. The first area is about 2,000 feet up from the start of the project. It's across from the Delano Park entrance number four. It included about 170 foot, six foot wide boardwalk and we're proposing to modify the plans to show that as a five foot wide bituminous sidewalk with a retaining wall. And the, the reason for that is just cost and logistics of maintaining the culverts that it's adjacent to. Um, that's, that, that's the first area. We're going to put a bituminous curb, add a catch basin, all the same amount of flow will go to the, the culvert that, that feeds that area. Um, and the second area is also includes a small boardwalk. It was a 40 foot long boardwalk adjacent to the Tide's Edge Road. In that area we're proposing to eliminate that boardwalk and install a five foot by eight foot long precast concrete structure that two culverts will tie into. We'll have a manhole port. It'll be easier. I've worked with Bob Malley. Um, we, we just felt that the logistics of maintaining that in both areas, that this would be a, uh, a better modification for the plans and the costs and, and future ma maintenance of that. Um, but for the most part, everything, everything else stays the same. It's the, the, the retaining wall that we're proposing in the first area adjacent to Delano Park is the same retaining wall feature aesthetically that we proposed in July. Uh, I proposed it, I actually submitted the cut sheet with the package that I presented to you. Um, be the same color, probably about three and a half feet wide, uh, tall in its highest um, place. The drainage, all the drainage features are the same. All the flow still continues to go to the same place that it would have been with the boardwalk. So it, it's truly just a logistics and a maintenance issue with the public works that we decided that it was in the best interest to change this um, in both areas. So what we, we deem them pretty, pretty minor changes, but we, we still wanted to bring that back to the board's attention. Go ahead. Not to be picky, but I've received calls from people wanting to know exactly where these things are located, and I just wanted to be clear that the boardwalk is across from Tide's Edge Road, not adjacent to it. Yes, it's across from, sorry. Yep. Yeah. You all start with your presentation? Yeah. Okay. So our new rules permit the opportunity for the public to make comments on the presentation. <laughs> Looks like we're not going to have any tonight. So questions, comments, thoughts, suggestions from the planning board? Eliza? Um, I'm curious, you mentioned that the retaining wall is going to be um, at its highest point, three and a half feet mm -hmm. tall. How does that compare to the height of the boardwalk at its highest point? That was, it was going to be pretty much the same height we were going to have to grade down off the boardwalk um, it's I mean obviously aesthetically from that side it's going to be a little different because you're going to be looking at the face of the wall that was my second question right. so you, you see the face of the wall then from yes shore road yep. and we provided a package to that um, homeowner that will be across the street yeah it's the uh, the one of four it's opposite the the ocean side yeah so if you look on sketch 101, okay. that is where that boardwalk was approximately 170 feet long. Okay. It was six feet wide. So now we're proposing just to bring it back to the five foot bituminous sidewalk and have the, the uh, retaining wall in that location. So okay. yes, it will be it's visually. It's the homeowners open. across the street. They won't see anything differently. It'll be from this view. Okay. So the wall will be on the side. Oh, okay. So the wall is facing outside. Right. As you're walking towards town, it's on the right. Okay. Yeah. That's my question. Why is he all set? Yep. Carolyn. 
So this makes public works life easier by doing it this way. It does it. Is that true or? Yeah, it was felt it would not only it was uh, there were some cost implications. It was more expensive um, and, and just logistically maintenance. Uh, I I worked with Bob and we just felt that it was easier for him to access both than trying to get under the boardwalk area. The in the sketch 101 option that existing 24 inch CMP that crosses the road, nothing will be changed. It'll actually come right out and it, the invert will be right outside the face of the wall. It'll stay in the same location. So we're not changing the length or the location of that culvert at all. The same amount of flow will feed that area. Um, it was just, it'll just be an easy access point for the, for the public works if you had to clean out the invert or anything like that in the future. Vacuum cleaning. <laughs> <laughs> okay, all set. Any other questions, comments, thoughts, suggestions? I have another question. I know there are some drainage issues along mm -hmm. this general section of Shore Road. Um, with the boardwalk, would, would the surface have been impervious? Would the rain have gone through it? And here is it going to wash off? What's yeah, uh, the same amount of flow will get to that culvert, um, I guess. How it gets. How it's it's just how it gets there. I mean, uh -huh. technically, the any surf any rainwater would have gone through the the breaks in the boardwalk, mm -hmm. and then slowly gone down to the, the same 24 inch. Right. However, in this new instance, flow will be sloped towards the curb inlet. Uh -huh. It'll go down to a catch basin, and it'll just be piped out into the same area, okay. go into a mi little micro depression in front of the 24 inch culvert. Uh -huh. So it's just a it's a little bit of different flow path, but it's the same amount of water. Will it get there faster? Um, I I mean I think it's already channelized now. So if it had gone through the boardwalk, we weren't going to modify the grading underneath. Uh -huh. So there's a channel that feeds it. So technically, some of the water could go down to a catch base and it's going to hit a sump so it doesn't shoot right out. It has to build up and then spill down into the, the pipe. But there is a depression under the 24-inch under the that crosses. So I think in the end, I think it, it's pretty much a wash. Yeah. Pardon the pun. <laughs> Just to understand this, the water will flow on the side of the retaining wall, along the retaining wall. Yeah, as you're looking um, on Sketch 101, mm -hmm. if I'm walking towards town, mm -hmm. uh, the flow will actually come back into the edge of pavement. So it'll come uh, on, the, on the retaining wall side. Yeah, it, the the retaining the the flow will actually the slope of the sidewalk will be towards the edge of pavement, towards the curb line, mm -hmm. and the flow will go down the curb line and hit a catch basin. Now, the catch basin you see that it will be adjacent to the 24 inch. That's the I, little. I see the catch basin. Yeah. So all that flow will come in from both sides. We'll catch it in the catch basin, and then a pipe will feed it back out into that little, the, you can see the depression. There's a little micro depression there, and then the water has to sit until it builds up enough to spill into that 24-inch cross culvert that'll stay in the and same way. from both sides then, essentially? Yeah, all the, there's, all the hydrology of it, it, it does feed from both sides. The amount of um, water that hits any of the impervious area is the same in both conditions. Also. So I, I have concerns about the drop off, three and a half feet, and the fact that it's more narrow than it was before. Um, what, what's more narrow? I feel like the, 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 the path, what it's gone from, it sounds like six feet to five feet. No. Did I? It, it's always been five feet. Oh, it has. Okay. It was designed as five feet. You approved it the first time as five feet, yeah. and they're proposing to keep it five feet. Okay. I thought I had heard six. Yeah, the sidewalk's all the same dimensionally okay. for the whole path, yeah. Has there been any um, communication other than just the notice of this meeting with the landowners adjacent to where these two changes would be? Yeah, we did provide um, packages to, to the, the abutting property owners. In fact, Bob mailed. Okay. In addition to the formal notice of this discussion tonight? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Also.
No other comments? Should I invite motions or we still have other questions? I mean, does anybody want to have a site walk? I don't. But I don't. Nope. I guess you should bring it up. I'm fine. But. The consensus is no. <laughs> Not again, I should say, because we've been out there once already. Is there, is there a, such a big drop off anywhere else on the path? I mean, three and a half feet just seems significant to me. If someone, if there were some congestion and someone were to go off the edge, am I the only one concerned about that? Yeah, I mean, this this is um, when we got the permit in July. Yeah. The cut sheet for the there's going to be a handrail on the retaining wall, and I think there's four other areas along the path where we have the retaining okay. wall. So it's the same facade that you're going to see the same color, John Mitchell, okay. the landscape so the architect. the rail's going to keep people from going. Oh, yeah. oh yes, everything's the same okay. as the original. Oh, yes. then, oh, you, oh, you, then you thought there was no rail or anything? Yeah. Oh, I there was oh I'm sorry. That's yeah. That yeah, no, it's going to match everything. You're going to have okay. the railing. The great. It, it actually looks like it's about three feet. I was looking at some of the spot grades there. Okay, so. great. That's great. <laughs> I have a motion for the board to consider. Go ahead, Jim. Findings of fact, the Town of Cape Elizabeth is requesting revisions to the previously approved site plan for the shore road path to convert two areas from boardwalk to fill slash solid surface with a retaining wall. Two, the application complies with the standards of section 19-9-5 site plan approval standards. Therefore, be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of the Town of Cape Elizabeth for revisions to the previously approved site plan for the shore road path to convert two areas from boardwalk to fill and solid surface with a retaining wall be approved. Second. A motion having been made by Jim uh, Hubner and seconded by Elaine Fallander. Any discussion on the motion? All in favor of the motion. All opposed to the motion. Motion carries 7 0. Thank you. Thank you. Next item on the agenda Portland Dry Cleaner Site Plan Amendment. Peter Jellison, I'm the uh, <clears throat> property manager for Pond Cove Shopping Center. Uh, I'm here tonight to assist the applicant, uh, Portland Dry Cleaners. Um, they are proposing to um, become a new tenant, <coughs> excuse me, a new tenant of ours uh, in the shopping center and will be occupying Unit 7, which is the uh, former Bank of America space. Um, the landlord, Lathrop and Lathrop, have uh, spent a fairly good sized chunk of money to update this uh, site plan, which uh, badly needed to be done. So uh, that's their contribution towards uh, supporting the applicant. Um, this will be a dry cleaning business, strictly pick up and drop off. Uh, basically two employees during the uh, operations, which will be from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. Monday through Saturday, and there are no exterior changes proposed in the building. There will be naturally some interior alterations, but the uh, footprints that showed on your plan that you have in your packet will remain the same. Um, we're all here tonight to answer any questions you have, but that's the basic uh, outline of the application. Okay. Actually, the first issue we have to consider is completeness. Uh, yeah. <laughs> On each stage, we're going to win. So the, um, we have a new procedure, so the public is invited to comment on completeness. So if anyone wants to comment, step up and comment. Hearing none, any board members have any issues regarding completeness of the information that we have in order to consider a site plan amendment? Good. The, um, 
We don't have any information on lighting or signage. Did you bring any information on either of those with you? Um, we would propose to naturally follow the town's signed ordinance and would have a basically approximately a 10 foot by 3 foot sign uh, which would be lit um, saying Portland Dry Cleaners on it. And that's on the face in front of the unit? That's correct. Right, and There's a kind of a square rectangular space right above the uh, entryway that's where the sign would be located. And then another sign on the, on yes, the board? on the front. common board out by uh, Ocean House Road, correct. Is that the only exterior lighting, the, the lighted sign? Correct, yes. Does that, does that exist, the lighting itself? No. no. I know the sign doesn't. I, no, there's no lighting there at this point. Yeah. Any other questions? No. no. no I'm just oh, curious. Barbara. I can't remember. What, what's the unit nine? Well, <clears throat> that's right behind number seven, and that is currently occupied by uh, Joseph Shalat, who's an architect. Oh, okay. I didn't realize he was in it from back there. Yep. Yeah, he's been in for about a month. Okay. So it was empty before that? For... It was empty for... It was a barber shop for many years. Yeah. Orig oh, originally a barber yeah, shop. Was back there. And then uh, Two Lights Home Care was there for Why quite a while. Oh. Sure. Yeah. Paula moved out front. Right. We might as well ask it now. Is there a rear access to the property, or will the daily dry cleaning be delivered through the front door? Yes. Uh, customer use the front door, and then we are uh, cleaning uh, stuff in our YouTube back door. So drop off in the back door. Customer use the front door. Okay, I'm trying to figure out where the back door is then, looking at Unit 9 and Unit 7. Right, where's the door? There is an alcove that shows on the print. Uh, I see that box right there. That's the correct. That's okay, so that box is not part of either Unit 9 or Unit 7. The box is a public area? That's correct. Okay. Yes, and that's, that's where the it. rear entrance door for the second point of egress is oh, okay. located. So I was not clear with how those boundaries sure. were defined there. It should come in this way. And is that also the main entrance then the for Unit 9? pulls back here. No, well, the main entrance for Unit 9 is uh, right here, kind of halfway down the uh, side facing to the north. Oh, I see. Okay, so we don't have the entrances shown on the site plan. No. Well, I think Tree Lane was all set. You all set? Or you, I think she's still thinking. Yeah. No, that's, that was good. I did read the explanation on the parking issue. I guess the whole parking lot is one space short of everything, but if you use it at different times, so it's not an issue, is what I understand. Mm, go ahead. My suggestion to the board is that you apply the shared parking concept, yep. which you've applied in other parts of the town center. Yep. And if you apply that, I think it's very easy for the board to find that there's more than adequate oh, parking. Oh, yes. I, I agree. I just, just bring We don't want to actually say you're short. <laughs> it's there somewhere. <laughs> Any other questions, comments, thoughts, suggestions? Hearing none, motions. I invite motions. And so we have to make two right now. One, we have to decide that the plan is complete. Go ahead, Barbara. Uh, motion, motion for completeness. Motion for the board to consider the in order that they plan <coughs> materials submitted in the facts presented the application of Duck B. Child. Of Portland Dry Cleaners for an amendment to the previously approved site plan for Pond Cove Shopping Center located at 327 Ocean House Road to open a dry cleaners pickup drop off establishment in the space previously occupied by Bank of America be deemed complete. Second. Motion having been made by Barbara Schenkel and seconded by Jim Hubner. Any discussion on the motion? Hearing none, all those in favor of the motion? All those opposed? Motion carries 7 0. Barbara? A findings of fact, Doug E. Cha of Portland Dry Cleaners is requesting an amendment to the previously approved site plan for the Pond Cove Shopping Center located at 327 Ocean House Road to open a dry cleaners pickup drop-off establishment in the space previously occupied by Bank of America, which requires review under Section 19-9 site plan regulations. Two, the application does not include information regarding lighting and signage. 
Three, the application substantially complies with Section 19-9 Site Plan Regulations subject to the submission of information referenced in Number 2 above. Therefore, be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of the, the application, that's a duplicate in there, of Duck He Cha of Portland Dry Cleaners for an amendment to the previously approved site plan for the Pond Clove Shopping Center located at 327 Ocean House Road to open a dry cleaners pickup drop off establishment in the space previously occupied by Bank of America be approved subject to the following condition. One, that information regarding exterior lighting and signage be submitted to the town planner prior to the issuance of a building permit or occupancy of the retail space. Second. Motion having been made by Barbara Schenkel and Caroline, seconded by Caroline Jordan. I, um, Maureen reminded me that we still have public comment on the application itself. Usually we do this in two steps. So if there's anyone else wishing to speak concerning the application itself, of the Portland Dry Cleaners for Site Plan Amendment. Step up. Hearing none, any discussion by the board on the motion? Go ahead, Elaine. Um, I had, a, on, on this part of the motion, I did have a couple of re requested amendments. Rather than referring to this space as the one previously occupied by Bank America, since the site plan has no indication of who the tenants are, um, I would like either in a, instead or in addition to also identify as this as unit seven as shown on the site plan. That's a good idea. Um, yeah, that kind of bothered me too. I didn't know quite how to deal with it. I think we can just reference yep. the plan. Um, the other <coughs> suggestion was it, it simply says that on the um, condition that information regarding lighting and signing be submitted doesn't specifically say that that signing and lighting needs to be in compliance with the applicable ordinance and regulations. And I think that probably should be added in there since we really haven't seen anything at all on that point. So that could be done by just um, that information regarding exterior lighting and signage in compliance with applicable ordinances and regulations be submitted to the town planner. And the other possible amendment, and Maureen, I'd, I'd ask you for a question here. Should we make a specific finding regarding shared parking? It is referred to in the AMEC letter that, that they have reviewed the parking assessment and agree with the shared approach. But I'm wondering if we need to make a specific finding. I, I think it's an excellent idea. Okay. There should be something in the record that says that, that you, you that you adopt this concept of shared parking for the site. Okay, is there a, I don't have the citation for that. But perhaps we could, in the findings of fact, add this as a finding of fact number three, um, that the applicant has proposed to adopt the shared parking arrangement permitted by the um, town center zoning ordinance and the um, parking assessment of the town engineer confirms that there is sufficient parking for that purpose. You referenced three, that would be four if we're adding. That would be three, and then old oh, four. would be yeah, four. Got it. Just I, that's fine. I just wanted to clear on the record. Right. Well, you, so, weren't, you weren't removing the current. No. And current three becomes four. Everyone understand what the amendment, the proposed amendment is? Barbara, it's your motion. Is it as amended now? Yeah, I didn't quite get the third one. Applicant has proposed to adopt shared parking allowed by town center regulations. Town center zoning ordinance. Zoning and ordinance. the town engineer has determined that the, um, the, the town engineer's parking assessment confirms that shared parking is sufficient for the site. It's fine. Okay. Motion having been made by Barbara Schenkels. Amended by Elaine Fallander. Second yeah. on the amendments as well by Caroline Jordan. Any further discussions, questions, comments, thoughts, suggestions on the pending motion with as amended? 
Hearing none, all in favor of the motion? All opposed to the motion? Motion carries 7 nothing. Thank you. Good luck. Thank you, Thank you very much for your time. Next item on our agenda tonight is uh, the Rooster Zoning Ordinance Amendment. I'll, I'll spare you though. <laughs> uh, the Town Council has referred to the Planning Board to request to consider amendments to regulate Roosters, Section 19-10-2 of the Zoning Ordinance Amendment Public Hearing. Um, somebody going to do a presentation on this? Oh, go ahead, Maureen. I'll make it brief. Yes. Uh, the, the town council referred a request to the planning board to look at the, the regulation of roosters, and it was in response to um, some concerns raised by residents and brought to the town council. The planning board uh, reviewed the concerns, also reviewed the recommendation from the Farm Alliance to not provide any change in regulation. Uh, what is being proposed for a, an amendment to the zoning ordinance tonight is to make it a requirement that if you have a rooster on your property, you have to have at least 40,000 square feet of lot area. 40,000 square feet is approximately one acre, and what this would do is it would pretty much eliminate the opportunity for roosters in the compact neighborhoods of Cape Elizabeth. Um, there's, if you had an unusual large lot right next to you, then they could still have a rooster. It's an attempt to, I think, by the board to balance the desires of the Cape Farm Alliance to promote agriculture and the desires of residents to not necessarily have a rooster crowing next door to them in a, in a very dense residential neighborhood. So what we have noticed tonight is a public hearing. So what I'm going to do is uh, open up the public hearing, invite anyone wishing to speak concerning the proposed amendments and the zoning ordinance concerning roosters. Good evening. Uh, my name is Gib Mendelson. My wife Sherry and I live at 20 Beacon Lane in Two Light. Early last summer, we were awakened by the crowing of a rooster and around 3.30 in the morning. Aside from the fact that we had no idea that our neighbor had acquired a rooster, we were shocked that it would begin crowing even before first light. The crowing continued thereafter throughout the morning and during the better part of the afternoon. Our neighbor's coop is directly across from our bedroom window, and like most of us, we do not have air conditioning, but rely on the wonderful ocean breezes that we've got here in Cape Elizabeth to keep us cool on summer nights. We closed our windows in an attempt to mute the annoying sounds of this bird's incessant crowing, but could still hear it for hours on end and, of course, lost our breeze. Each of our other neighbors joined with us in complaining about this disruption to our lives, both to the offending neighbor as well as to the municipal officials with no success. Approximately one month after the rooster arrived, he disappeared as mysteriously as he had come. <laughs> our understanding is that its owner couldn't stand the crowing any more than we could. <laughs> the rooster appeared once more for a brief period of time, but fortunately for us, is no longer present. When we moved to Cape Elizabeth from a suburb in Pittsburgh nine years ago, we were drawn to this community for those regions, reasons which make it such a unique place to live in, an extraordinary, an extraordinary mix of a rural seaside and agricultural community which values the protection of the environment and the preservation of its lifestyle without unfettered development or the imposition of numerous municipal restraints that preclude each of us from enjoying the lifestyle as we see fit. That being said, we're not a community of islands or an industrial park. We're a residential community. And with that comes the need for each of us to respect the rights of our neighbors and to live our lives so as not to disturb or invade the rights of others around us. As members of this community, each of us has the right to expect no less. And as taxpayers, we should be afforded protection by the town when something so basic, something so basic as the quiet enjoyment of our homes are infringed upon and the offender will not stop. There's been an ordinance in Cape Elizabeth for over 40 years which reads as follows. No person shall own, keep, or harbor any dog which by loud, frequent, and habitual barking, howling, or yelping shall disturb the peace of any person or persons. I don't know how many of you on the board have ever been subjected to the incessant crowing of a rooster, but I assure you as a dog owner of 40 years 
and one who's always lived next to dogs, I'll take barking every time. Seriously, the point is that if we are constrained to prevent our family pets from disturbing the peace, why shouldn't the same good logic that requires us to do so apply to the cloying crow of a rooster? By the way, an attempt at solic soliciting some assistance from the police for disturbing the peace was rejected out of hand as the offensive noise was not being made by a human. In the executive summary of the town's comprehensive plan, there are several items listed as challenges. Number four is respecting the rights of private property owners. It's a basic function of government to aid in the preservation of that right. I appreciate your attempt to remedy the problem at hand by limiting the ownership of roosters to homeowners with lot sizes of 40,000 square feet or more. It would solve my problem because the offender has much less than 40,000 square feet. But it ignores the practical fact that a rooster's crow carries a great distance and lot size does not guarantee separation from the offender in any event. My property is 100,000 square feet and I could situate a coop 30 feet from one of my neighbor's bedroom windows because, our, because the setback ordinance in Cape Elizabeth has been construed not to apply to chicken coops. A rooster is not needed for a hen to lay eggs. Roosters are rarely raised for consumption. Fertilized eggs aren't to be eaten. There's no reason to have roosters unless you're a commercial farmer in Cape Elizabeth, period. Please do the right thing tonight. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to speak concerning the amendment, proposed amendment? Hearing none, I'll close the public hearing and open it up to comments, questions, thoughts, suggestions from the planning board. Elaine. My understanding is that if we, that the, uh, an amendment to the disturbing the peace ordinance that would include roosters with dogs and other pets is not a part of the ordinance that's under our jurisdiction, is that correct? Correct. Yeah. Okay, so that even if we wanted to make or agreed with you that what we're doing is not sufficient, that's really not something within our jurisdiction to do and the appropriate place to make that suggestion would really be with the town council. Which is where this recommendation where this or not is going next as right. well. Right. Right. But your point is well taken that lot size is no guarantee that neighbors won't be disrupted and it's something that we talked about in one of our workshops. Mm -hmm. But it was also felt that, that you couldn't contain a rooster within the lot. So we couldn't, we couldn't uh, apply setbacks to the roosters that they roam. I don't know, maybe it sounds like your neighbor's rooster was confined to a coop, however. No, the, the, oh. the rooster was allowed to roam free yeah, so. And you could still have a 40,000 square foot lot and they put the coop right there on the lot line. Yeah. And you haven't solved anything. But yeah, and that, that reminds me, I was interested in another comment you made that, um, that coops are, are not construed as structures that are subject to the setbacks. So I was hoping maybe Maureen, you could address that. I was surprised to That's hear you really say that. It call for the code enforcement officer. Yeah, that's an interpretation and issue. Is that what the code enforcement officer told you? That's correct. There, there are many that logically would proceed to be structures that are not construed under the zoning ones to be the structures in capitalism. It depends how it's built. If, if, if we're going to ask him some more questions, I'm going to just ask him to step up okay. so we can get it on the record. I'm all set though, but do you have any more questions of the gentleman? I do. Sorry. <laughs> I do. You can stop. <laughs> thank you, and thank you for getting up. I appreciate that. I think I'm guessing, and I don't know, that it might be because it's not for humans to live in. Well, that, 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 I'm not going to speculate. Yep. Oh, in terms of being a structure, but uh, the, that the proposed. I have no the problem amending the ordinance to say that. Not to, the definition of structure to well, include a coop. Yeah, I don't, tonight. Uh, I get a whole new. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I've seen some coops that could be very temporary. You can move them around. And, and I don't. We haven't vetted that out in a workshop either. I, I would feel uncomfortable doing that here. Mm -hmm. 
No, you know. it, when we were discussing this at the workshop, I think we were discussing lot size. Mm -hmm. We did discuss, I brought up that I would like to see this at a larger size because there is a point where um, having livestock is considered commercial. Was, was it 100,000? 100,000. 100,000 feet. You're a commercial farmer, less than 100,000. I presented that to the board that why don't we make this at 100,000 and we had a discussion and the discussion um, brought it to 40,000 but this will go on to the council and that's just an idea that I'm sharing with you. Why was, why was the if, you, if you just could step up, I <laughs> probably should have just had you stay there. What was the rationale behind reducing the, uh, the minimum lot size? There was no lot size. It was more previously. a compromise. I think. Initially, roosters were allowed without restriction in a residential zone. The proposal was made that perhaps some restriction should be imposed. The Cape Farm Alliance reviewed that proposal and came back and recommended that no change be made in keeping with the um, direction in the comprehensive plan that we be as farm friendly as we can be. So the 40 acre or essentially one acre lot restriction that the planning board came up with was an effort to compromise between the no restriction, which was the approach uh, desired by the Cape Farm Alliance, and some, some significant restriction um, that other people were suggesting this was a compromise between the two. Okay, but, but based on the discussion that we're having this evening, I, I would hope that you would see the logic that a, a space encompassing only 40,000 square feet really doesn't solve the problem. The potential. I have no the problem with the the in, in, in truth, in truth, the, the, a delimiting factor predicated on space alone, other than large properties like, commer like the commercial farms that we have in Cape doesn't really solve the problem because, because of the fact that a chicken coop which houses the roosters is not subject to the um, setback requirements of the zoning ordinance. So if you had 28 so, so, so you could still put it next to a home. Yeah, it's a, it's a futile act. The, 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 in, in truth what needs to be done and I, I, I think that there I, I'm not going to embarrass him by, by asking him to call forward, but uh, John Green from the Cape Alliance is, is here, and, and I think he's going to write a letter uh, to the board, which, which may in some way modify what the, the initial thinking was of the, I don't want to speak for you, John, but um, uh, th there just is no point, ladies and gentlemen, for anyone other than a farmer who is, who is raising chickens, who, who wants to propagate their flock for commercial purposes to own roosters in this community. And whether you live in, in uh, um, a, a highly settled area like Broad Cove or Shore Acres or Mountain View, uh, a person, people such as my wife and I, who, who live in uh, a less settled area, but in close proximity to other houses, still deserve the same protection. We're taxpayers. You know, I'd be curious about the answer to that direct question. I mean, why, why, why two, two approaches. One would be to amend the nuisance ordinance that you described. The other one would be, what, why, why, why do you need a rooster? I guess that's a simple question. Well, why should that option be available for Cape residences? Residences. Why I'm not asking you that. I guess I'm asking somebody from the Farm Alliance to respond. I mean, why would one want to keep a rooster other than if they're unless they're not ra if they're not raising chickens? Could we have John come up and talk about this a little? <laughs> he's he's a, he's a reluctant speaker, but but I would appreciate it. Would you be willing to address that, John? Thanks, John. I appreciate it.
Hello, I'm uh, John Green from the Cape Farm Alliance. Thank you. Um, as far as roosters go and um, why people need them or, or use them in farms, I can't answer that question because I'm not a farmer. Um, we could always uh, have someone write in uh, that, that farms roost, you know, uh, chickens with roosters. Uh, what I will say is we were hanging our hat on the disturbing the peace ordinance portion of the ordinance. In other words, um, it, it says in there, if a person is disturbing the peace, well, if a person has a motorcycle, is the motorcycle disturbing the peace, or is it a person that owns the motorcycle oh, yeah. disturbing the peace? Okay. So our position was, you know, there's something on the books with disturbing the peace. Um, that is the direction the Farm Alliance was taking this uh, without <coughs> altering any other ordinances. We weren't saying that we didn't want to see some remedy to this. We were just saying that uh, um, just placing it or dealing with it as is in the current ordinance and figuring out a way to say roosters are part of that disturbing the peace portion of the ordinance. And if it, if it worse comes to worse, add roosters under the dog section where incessant crowing fits in as does incessant barking. Um, so that, that's sort of the look we were taking. Um, not altering, I, I, my understanding was I thought the planning board had jurisdiction over those portions. That I did not know that that was strictly a town council issue. Uh, so I suppose we would write an additional letter clarifying uh, our position. Yeah, those other two ordinances aren't land use. That's what yes, I see that now. Um, so that was our mistake. And, and, our and I guess the larger question is, and I missed the, the workshop on this, is it an appropriate land use regulation to regulate something that potentially causes noise. I mean, some dogs bark, some dogs don't bark. Roosters apparently all crow, and some more than others. Right. Again, I don't know. I've, I've heard both. I, I think that is the case, some more than others. Okay. So maybe solving it the same way you solve a, a dog problem, dog barking problem is a better way to describe it, might be the better approach, rather than land use, especially when the tools we have don't fit solving the problem. Correct. That's, that's the idea. We gross have. square footage apparently doesn't solve the problem. No. Right. Um, that's why we say leave well enough alone, let's go the other route. I, just, I, I clearly see this as a potential problem that needs to be addressed. I just don't know that this is, this is the right approach. That's my view on it so far. Go ahead. Uh, I, it, uh, I was pointing to the Victoria. Um, I would be concerned when we talk about um, the disturbing the peace section. Because um, it, it does, it says no person shall, and it says what they shall not do, and it includes unnecessary or unusual noise. I would say a rooster crowing is not unnecessary or unusual. Roosters crow. So I don't really feel comfortable amending no, we, the peace. We, we, we don't have any say in that. Right, and I wouldn't feel comfortable putting the roosters under the dog ordinance. Well, would be I don't feel comfortable going in either of those directions. So once again, I would go back to land use because it's very clear that we have a cutoff on what is considered commercial. And the state does have the right to farm statutes, which defines farm and farm operations as entities and operations associated with commercial production. In Cape Elizabeth, once again, commercial production is 100,000 square feet or just over two acres. So I do support the right to farm, and, but I also support that I live in a very dense neighborhood and I would not want to hear those roosters. And so once again it was back to this compromise on what do you do for the dense residential, but however this is, we do have farms and this is a farming community and that's why I initially threw out the 100,000 because that would fall under the right to farm laws, which would go back to the planning board because that is land use. But why would you not include that under the same as the dog barking? Because they're fowls, they're not canines. Well, but I mean, it's an animal noise. And it's, I guess to me, my first reaction is, a, I agree with what you're saying, this is not our jurisdiction, but maybe the ordinance about dog barking should include rooster growing. Would Could you ever would any, silence would any a rooster? Animal. Could yeah. You, I don't know, can you ever silence a rooster. A dog, you could bring them in. I mean, I could see. Not all dogs bark. A barking dog, you can bring in. You could control that. But do all roosters crow? Is this something that you could silence and say, well, 
you know, that's the correct way to take care of this. Do you bring the rooster indoors? Well, ain't gonna happen. Right, that's not gonna happen. So, yeah. so once again, they're very different than the dog, and that's why I was thinking you don't handle it with the dog. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I want to make a quick comment. Now, I, I think we need to focus in on this is a land use recommendation or not. I mean. If we think there's another way to handle a problem, that's for the political process in this town council. But you know, I'm, I'm looking at this very, very narrowly. Is this proposal a, an appropriate land use amendment to solve the problem? I don't think it'll solve the problem. Solve the problem. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm sorry. I talked and then Elaine, go ahead. I actually think it can help address the problem. I mean, to me, the ideal solution would be a combination of something like a one-acre restriction and a noise ordinance because we can't, it, it seems to me quite likely, if not certain, that on a smaller lot, a crowing rooster is going to disturb the neighbors and we don't want to have the police going out you know, all the time for, so that every instance of a rooster being out there is going to cause a problem. By des designating a one acre lot, it seems to me creates the possibility on that lot that a landowner could find a spot on the lot where the rooster was far enough from the lot perimeter so that it would not cause a disturbance. I don't think we can define that setback. I think that setback would probably apply equally to a cow or a horse or something else that made loud noise in the farming community. And I think that's a pretty difficult thing to do. But I think that by creating this one acre lot, then if you have a really noisy rooster, were there to be an amendment to the dog barking ordinance, wherever that sits, then the discussion with the landowner could be that where you have your rooster sighted on your lot, you're disturbing the peace. If you move it behind your house, screened by your garage, and pen it in, you've got a whole acre to work with. That's a situation where you might be able to keep a rooster without disturbing the peace. So I actually think that by creating this one acre lot minimum, we are accompli making, accomplishing something. I don't think our work is complete unless the town council were also to go ahead and do something with the dog parking ordinance. But we can't do that. Uh, yeah, I, and uh, at, at the risk of uh, taking a position against my own self and lighted interest, because, <laughs> um, as I, as I said to you, the situation that my wife and I find ourselves in would be obviated by a 40,000 acre, a 40,000 square foot uh, restriction. Um, but I'm here um, as a citizen of this town and to sort of plead the case for those who might find themselves similarly situated. Let me throw out a fact to you that uh, I learned today doing a little, doing a little research. Um, the southeast portion of Cape Elizabeth is uh, primarily encompassed by uh, shore acres. Um, um, 60, the, the vast majority of the homes in the southeast portion of Cape Elizabeth have lots of, of 67,000 plus square feet. So anyone in any any one of those people that are are uh, in shore acres as an example um, uh, could could have chickens and and i would uh, a acre and a half roughly sorry acre and a half 60,000 square feet that's, that's roughly acre, acre and, and a half, half. yeah yeah, yeah. Um, it, it is really only the most densely settled areas that would probably be protected by the 40,000 square feet. I'm talking about Mountain View and- but, uh, but if we did that and the town council were to take up an additional regulation to solve more significant should, problems, but, but, yeah, whatever, you know, and whatever, then sort of see how that goes. And if it sort of pops, pops up again, I guess I, I'm, my mind would be yeah. that's a fair compromise. And if it didn't solve the problem, then you go back to the drawing board. It seems that uh, uh, 100,000 square feet is, is, the, uh, is the rule of thumb for, 
for the, the, the housing of animals in this town, unless you're in a commercial setting. I, I'm not sure why you couldn't conform that. I have no problem with that. I, you know, I have a question, and the question is, and I know we discussed this at, the, at a workshop, and some of us felt that we shouldn't restrict as much as 100,000 square feet, but, you know, listening to the argument, it makes some sense, and I think, Victoria, you came out very strongly about restricting as much as possible, but um, how many farms are there under 100,000 square feet? Not too many. Not too many. Are there any? Well, yes. The, well, the, yeah. There's, there are places where you, you may have a large lot of land, and yet farmers are leasing only a small area, which they're actually growing crops on. So there's always the question of, do you look at the whole lot, or do you look at just the area they're farming? Um, well, I, I suppose we could say 100,000 square feet unless the land is being used for commercial commercial farming purposes. But, but let's, let's assume you, you, you use it. Under ahead. the ordinance, it says that you're raising of animals for commercial purposes, you need 100,000 square feet. So then 100,000 square feet wouldn't affect anything. I mean, it would be, you'd have to have 100,000 square feet if we put it in that way, if, if or recommend it that you way. accept the argument that the only reasonable, the only reasonable reason to have a rooster walking around is because you're raising chickens and that that is a commercial enterprise and then the ordinance says that to have a commercial enterprise with animals you need 100,000 square feet then yes you're not adding any more restrictions if you accept that someone might just want to enjoy the farming lifestyle and have a rooster running around with the chickens then yes those people are going to be restricted by having less than 100,000 square feet And if you did the 100,000 square feet, would you still see the need to have the nuisance ordinance changed? Well, it really limits how many people can, but, uh, yeah, but, but we don't have any control over that, so there's no reason to even I'm, discuss it. That's true. You can recommend. Yeah. Unless we, we have recommend. setback restrictions, it doesn't matter. <laughs> I, don't think, I don't think going to 100,000 square feet is going to solve the noise issue, unless there's setback restrictions. But well, in fact, but, but what it does is it limits the number of people. It, 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 solves, it solves the problem for a greater number of homeowners. Yeah. Yeah, it, it does. That's right. But, okay. At, at the end of the day, uh, unless there is a, and again, I, I ask you not to hold this against me. In, in arguing against my own self and life interest. At the end of the day, if one neighbor is not willing to have respect for the right of others, th this is all for naught anyway. You could have a million square feet, it wouldn't matter. And because of the, because of the lack of restriction uh, on setback. But we need to do something. If, if, if there were roosters crowing in Mountain View, in Shore Acres, <laughs> as they were be a for a people. month at our house last summer, this hall would be filled. Uh, I, I implore you, do something. Don't kick this upstairs. Take it as a land use problem, do something at least at this level, and then we'll try to do something at the council level. We certainly haven't had any comments from rooster lovers. <laughs> no, and, and this... But we do have the recommended, the formal recommendation from the Cape Farm Alliance, with, which represents a significant part of the citizens of the town, and we have one neighbor here and maybe we've had a letter for two so if you kind of balance the amount of public comment that we have gotten but i've got to assume what's, that what's the cape the farm alliance is commercial farms and those are we're, under no we're not asking just, we're, we're not, i'm not asking that no. that roosters be banned from cape elizabeth 
I'm asking that roosters be banned unless they're needed for some commercial purpose to sustain the commercial farms. And doesn't that protect the residential portions of Cape? I mean, the push we, we've been just we've been going through the last year and a half is we're, we're trying to continue to encourage the rural character of the town. So we're not taking them out completely. We're just setting up for one particular the, thing, the rooster, a brighter line as to where they're supposed to be and where they're not supposed the, to be. The rural, the rural character of this town mm. has to be weighed in connection with the, the sanctity and the rights of the people who live in this town. I agree, but, and I'm suggesting that imposing this restriction doesn't even take away from the rural character in a dramatic way. Of course fashion. it doesn't. You know, it just, it, it, I mean, personally, it doesn't bother me, but I could easily see how it can get out of hand. And that's, you know, I'm trying to prevent a repeat of what you're, you're saying. And I, I just don't know that 40,000 does the trick. I guess that's what I'm looking at. 40,000 doesn't what? Doesn't do, doesn't do it. I mean, I'm not even sure 100 does, but at least it's, it sets up something. And I don't think you're going to get a lot of people in here looking to change it to the opposite. Golly, I really want a rooster. Would you lower that limit? <laughs> not, not a big constituency. Well, I don't you know, think. we can make it 100,000 feet. And if people, and Carol, man, maybe you can talk more about this, but if there are people who need to farm and, and raise chickens, then they can go in front of the town council and ask them to lower it. Go ahead. Maureen already said, if you're going to be a commercial enterprise, as far as animals go, you have to have 100,000 100, feet. 100, square feet anyway. So, so that 100,000 You can grow square as many feet. quiet plants as you want on an acre, so and nobody's going to stop you, but you can't be considered a commercial animal operation unless you have 100,000 Well, square maybe feet. we ought to make it 100,000 square feet and make it consistent. That, that seems logical to me. I mean, and somebody can still have chickens on their home lot, like, right? It's the roosters we're talking about. I guess I'm personally troubled with our effectively defining the keeping of a rooster as <laughs> automatically equivalent to commercial agriculture without getting input on that question from the farmers in the community, including the small farmers in the community. So perhaps what this is a question that, that sure. we don't have specific input, and that's effectively what you're doing, saying that there is no such thing as a non-commercial operation that includes a rooster even for a short period of time. You couldn't even bring a rooster on to do whatever roosters do and then <laughs> remove the rooster. You just couldn't have a rooster in that. In a small farm. In a small farm. And, and I, and I don't I, feel that I have the expertise to say that, that that's a correct determination. I, I hate to say this, but what this is sounding like is this needs to go back. To a workshop. more workshop. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. I think that begs the issue. Why is that? The, 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 the issue still comes down, at least in my humble opinion, mm. to the fact that there is absolutely no way under any ordinance in this town to, to uh, uh, have some recourse against a horrible annoyance. It's not a farming issue. This is an issue about... And, and that just points me to the fact, that, okay, it's not a land use issue. This forum, I'm sorry, go to the, go to the town council and see if you can't get the annoyance issue to I be addressed. I think town council, though, is going to look to this forum. Not, not, not for the dog, not for the other amendments we're talking about. That's really out of, not our, not our I won't even say jurisdiction. Purview. Yeah, exactly. I, well, I, I so I mean, we're talking about a land use a land land use restriction, and I'm trying to balance two things: the fact that we are and continue to be a residential community where people are entitled to some peace and quiet, but we're also trying to encourage um, as much of the rural and farming community, even plants on one acre lots, self-sustaining, et cetera, et cetera. You know, and I'm 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 starting to agree with Elaine, maybe because if there's some input that we need to figure out whether even bringing them on temporarily makes some sense, maybe that's one way to go rather than kicking it upstairs.
because that's my other alternative is to say this is much more a political question. We, we've had a work, at least one workshop on this, mm. and nobody's come up and, uh, um, to, to comment about wanting to keep roosters and make the argument that roosters aren't an agricultural activity. I mean, I, I just think if we have another workshop, we're not, not going to get other, we're not going to get a lot of comment pro-rooster pro on small lots. I'm still not clear as to why the Farm Alliance wouldn't have done that if they, because they had the chance already once. I missed the workshop, and I apologize for that. But we didn't get any, we didn't get any comment or a written comment, yeah. Maureen. Yeah, got a written letter from that. Yeah, John just John just explained that they thought it, they it think it's a noise or a noise issue, not right, right. So, so from a zoning issue, they're saying stay out of it. But we're exploring a separate issue. Right. Right. Are they pets, I guess the other comment I would make is something about the procedure we're going through tonight. Um, the kind of interaction with the public that we're having tonight is, is kind of unusual. It's a different way of, of conducting a discussion. Um, my guess is not every member of the public who might have wanted to be here tonight realized that this kind of continuous dialogue back and forth with the planning board was going to happen. Um, perhaps we would have had more people here. I'm not sure this is the best way for us to conduct our business, um, but it, it seems to me that perhaps we haven't given, because of the change in our rules, perhaps we haven't given the full opportunity to everyone to understand the process. Um, so I would feel much more comfortable giving more time for fuller public comment from all points of view on this question before taking action. Let's Is delay any, will that change our minds? I mean, we're just delaying things. It might change my mind, yeah. Right. I mean, if, if I could have some people with farming experience come and tell me, you know, there really is no point in having a rooster if you don't have a commercial operation then that's a really easy thing. But I know Carol has some farming background, but I'm not sure you're comfortable saying chickens, that. So. <laughs> Pardon me? I don't raise chickens. So. Right, so we don't have anyone who can, who who's, says that they're qualified to tell us that, and I'd, I'd like that input. Is, is, is the proposal to amend the noise ordinances going forward in the town council independent of this process? No. Does anyone know that? No. 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 Nobody's made that proposal. You're the only show in town. Right now. Mm. <laughs> I don't know if that makes me want to act more or less. But <laughs> Rather than moving forward with an ordinance to just kind of a, a guess and say, okay, let's just do something and move it to the town council, I'd prefer to do what we truly believe is the correct thing to do. Yeah. And, and I don't yet feel that I know what the correct thing to do is. And I... I I think it will ultimately point to the direction that you're talking about, that if we get the input that there's no reason to really have these things, have roosters beyond commercial operations. Personally, I'd be more inclined to move, you know, move the proposal to 100 and say, other than that, no roosters, if that's the input we get. Right, I agree. Which we don't, I agree with Elaine, we don't have right now. I'm, I don't disagree with you, I just feel like I want to hear from some other folks too. I agree with Elaine too. That's no harm, your rooster's gone. <laughs> In the short term, there's nothing to prevent it from coming back. I don't think this will last more than one more cycle. No. Workshop back to the forum, right? Back to this forum. Right. Does that seem... Barbara's not going to be here, so she's not going to be here. <laughs> yeah, especially if we then explore setbacks and the definition of a structure. I am really, I'm just I'm really reluctant to go down that road, I honestly, but... Okay. If you go back to a workshop, is anybody from the farm lines going to show up? I mean, we need, you need to ask them. That's, yeah, specific. And that's, that's in the more specific request. Good, John. Just briefly, we, we do have some uh, members who have micro farms that have roosters, and oh. uh, we will attend a workshop just to provide input one way or the other. That would be great. Yeah. yeah. And we'll make a point of showing up at that meeting. Well, I think that's why initially we went with 40,000 square feet. 
was because why? Well, it's because there were some small farms, and uh, we wanted to accommodate the farmers and still protect the landowners in tight areas with small lots. I make motion. Stuart Tabor. All right. Motion for the board to consider be it ordered that the draft Brewster amendments to the joint zoning ordinance be tabled until the January 2011, January 3rd or 4th. To, no, that's the workshop. Can we table it to a workshop? Sure. sure. Okay, January 4th, planning board workshop. Second. Carolyn, you second. Sorry. Motion has been made by Elaine Fowler and seconded by Carolyn Jordan. Any discussion on the motion? Hearing none, all in favor of the motion? All opposed to the motion? Motion carries 7 nothing. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you for your time. Be sure to come to the workshop. I will. January 4th? Yeah. Right. 7 o'clock. Sorry? 7 o'clock. 7 o'clock. Here or and next, next room over? Next room over. On the other side of the wall over here. And the other th comment I would make is that any written statement from a member of the public um, can be circulated and become part of the public record. So if you have a written statement that you would like to email uh, and anyone else the same thing, that would also be helpful and we would have it in front of us at the workshop. So that to, 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 to Maureen, not to us individually. Yeah, to Maureen. Thank you for your input. Thank you. Much appreciated. Um, next item on the agenda, the flagpole zoning ordinance regulations the town council refer to the planning board a request to consider amendments to, the regu to regulation of flagpoles i assume section 19-10-2 zoning ordinance amendment public hearing maureen do you have an introduction for us yes this is another item that's been referred to the planning board by the town council there was um, uh, there were two residents residents in particular who had a disagreement about placement of a flagpole in close proximity to a sideline property line. Uh, there was a recommendation from the town council to send this to the planning board. The planning board uh, did a survey of how flagpoles are regulated in other areas. They determined that the town attorney has agreed that a flagpole is a structure and as a structure it should uh, have to comply with side yard setback requirements and based on that information uh, the planning board has come up with a recommendation that no additional regulation of flagpoles is needed. So uh, tonight's public hearing is to talk about whether or not uh, the planning board should go back and come up with some regulations or just send this kind of recommendation to the council. So since it's known as for public hearing, I will open the public hearing and invite the public to who wishes to discuss the flagpole while well, the proposed amendments to the flagpole ordinance come up to the podium and state state your name and make your comments yeah, no you have to step all the way up to the microphone sir my name is uh, bruce nelson i live at uh, 890 shore road and uh, I'm here, uh, I'm surprisingly here, because this uh, issue took place two years ago. And uh, the town attorney ruled that a flagpole is a structure and is, uh, uh, should be uh, uh, behind the 20-foot side setback. And um, subsequently, although it took some time, the neighbor's flagpole was moved substantially somewhere else and uh, so I thought that the issue was moot and uh, I'm surprised that it's here but I understand that once something starts it doesn't stop very easily so I uh, I concur with the town uh, 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 staff who has feels that the this any changes are not appropriate and that we should keep the rules the way they are. Because of the interpretation that we have? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone, any other members of the public wishing to speak? Seeing none, I'll close the public hearing and open it up to comments from the board. Go ahead. 
Does this memo become part of what goes to the board? Because I just had some editorial questions about it. Uh, actually, it applies to the town council. Generally, the memo is, or is it? not something we vote on. It's usually something that either Maureen and the chair work out to send, send it over. Um, if you think that it should be amended, though, I'm certainly happy to. I just to. had a, a question in the, in the discussion section in the second paragraph. Okay. The sentence kind of in the middle. South Portland does not consider a flagpole to be a structure and does not require flagpoles to meet setbacks, but do expect the flagpole to be installed on the owner's property. I'm, I'm not sure what that, the final phrase of that really means. So somebody else's property, I guess? Yes. Who? It seemed fairly obvious, I guess, but. I share the information that's provided. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's not required to do. It should say, does expect. Yes. It does expect the flagpole to be installed on the owner's property. As opposed to not on the owner's property. Yeah, meaning to your neighbor. As opposed to flagpole and installing it in the right of way or on oh, somebody sure. else's property. Actually, the right of way would be just as much. Or someone else's you know, property. Yeah. <laughs> As Jim said, that seems pretty obvious. <laughs> well, you'd think so, but. But the confusion that I've seen historically, okay. Maureen, is, is people don't always know where their own property ends exactly. in the right of way begins. Could we say, do require that a, an owner? I use the words that, that you I got a direct. Say. Okay, this is directly from South Point. Okay, thank you. <laughs> All right. I had, I had another question about the suggested motion. It's stated in the negative, and it seemed to me perhaps it would be more appropriate to state it in the positive. Recommend no change, something like yeah, that. Yeah, or recommends that the council make no change. Well, when you make the motion. Okay. <laughs> I, I agree with you on that. Go for it, Elaine. Ellen, okay. Unless there's any other comments. Anybody have any more comments? But we can comment once the motion has been made and seconded, too. Motion for the board to consider, be it ordered, that based on the materials and facts presented, the planning board recommends that the town council make no change to existing regulation of flagpoles. Second. Like motion having been made by Elaine Fallender, seconded by Jim Hubner. Any discussion on the motion? Hearing none, all those in favor of the motion? All those opposed? Motion carries 7-0. Seven, seven At this point, before we all pack up, we have the public comment on items not on the agenda. <laughs> Hearing none, I would just like to personally say thank you very, very much to Barbara Schenkel. It's been a wonderful eight years serving with you on the board. And uh, I, I truly believe you are the best example of the citizen planner serving. I truly mean that. Thank you very much for serving with Thank me. Thank you. We're here. I'd also like to thank all of you because it's been a pleasure to serve on this board. I see some other things that happen, and this is really a great group of people. Always has been intelligent, committed, and just delightful. So thank you all. And you can make the motion to adjourn. I make the motion to adjourn. <laughs> All in favor of the motion to adjourn. Made by Barbara. Thank you. Good night. Wait till we're off the air.